Praise the Lord and good morning. This is a mighty good morning. Dear precious Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you again, God, for giving us the opportunity to get together and to talk about you, Lord. Talk about Jesus. And we're just excited about the word, God. We want you to hide this word. We want to hide this word in our heart so we may not sin against you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, we have a beautiful lesson today. Um, our lesson subject is Jesus points to Jonah. Our lesson text is found in Matthew, the 12th chapter, verses 22 through 32. Then it goes to verses 38 through 40. The time is AD 28 and the place is Galilee. Our golden text is he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathered, gathered not with me scattered abroad. Matthew 12, 30. The lesson outlines, there's three lesson outlines. And the first one is responding with amazement. Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 22 through 23. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. All of the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Just a little introduction to our lesson. In the Gospels, some of the most sustained human opposition to Jesus came from the Pharisees. These highly respected and influential Jews scholars prided themselves on being more righteous than others. Jesus looked beyond their righteous appearance and saw them as frauds. Rather than respond with repentance and obedience to Jesus, most Pharisees actively opposed him. When Jesus performed miracles proving that he was the Messiah, the Pharisees refused to accept the evidence. Instead, they charged him with working with Dinami, demon spirits, okay? So everyone, um, they were amazed and they knew that this man, not only was he blind, he was deaf and he had demons. So they know there was no doctor that could heal this man. So why was the healing of the demon possessed man a particular impressive demonstration of Jesus? It was obvious that the man had been in clutches of the devil. This was much more than just a physical problem, okay? So you have physical illness plus you're, you have demons. And we're going to go into demons because we have a beautiful presentation at the end. In order to release him from his disabilities, Jesus had to break evil's grip on him. Everyone knew that demon possession was a potent force that required more than mere human ability to cure. Why did the people ask whether Jesus was the son of David? And the Old Testament prophesied that Messiah would perform miracles, healings. The healing Jesus had accomplished prompted the people to wonder whether he might be the Messiah. Now they knew the word. They knew that there was going to be the son of David. They knew that Jesus was going to come on board, but they did not want to accept it. Reasoning against criticism. We're going to go to verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons, but by Belbuzu, Bel Belzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Jesus, he did nothing good, nothing but good. However, the Pharisees flatly refused to consider that he was the Messiah. And then Jesus went on to and said, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then the kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub 
cast out devils? By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or how else can one enter unto a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattered abroad. So I want to go back into go into some of these verses so you can understand what was going on. As we said, Jesus did nothing good. However, the Pharisees, they flat refused to consider the Messiah. However, they could not deny that Jesus had exercised power over the demon. They knew there was a higher power that got those demons out of the man. Rather than admit that Jesus was divine, they concluded that Jesus had worked by the power of Beelzebub, or Satan, the prince of demons. The Pharisees then accused Jesus to be a sorcerer, which was a serious charge, punishable by death under the Jewish law. What the Pharisees was demonstrating on the outside was not a clear reflection of the love of God. Now, these Pharisees, they were actually hypocrites. They were liars. On the outside, they did all the sermons and, and they looked, they looked as they say, holy. But on the inside, their heart was not right. In Luke 6 and 7, it says, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him. They watched Jesus, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. They were looking to find fault with Jesus. Although the Pharisees did not directly speak to Jesus, okay, Jesus was aware of what they were thinking. So God knows our heart. He knows our intention. They had already decided that they, not, that they would reject Jesus and they did not want him to convince them otherwise. Instead of acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, they accused him of working with Satan. Jesus did not even fit their description of a Messiah. He didn't look like a Messiah that they were uh, thinking how he should look. They did not know him. They did not want to know him. And they did not like him. Have anyone ever asked, have you ever asked anyone and said, why do you not like that person? They answer you, I just don't like them. No reason, never been hurt by the person, just don't like them. I don't like how they look, don't like how they talk, don't like how they walk. I just don't like them. This is how the Pharisees felt about Jesus. They were not going to receive Jesus. They just did not like him and they were not going to receive his word. However, the Pharisees were also very jealous of Jesus. Jesus' ministry had expanded and it had been effective. People had been healed and, and he was getting, he was very popular. And this is what the Pharisees did not like. And even in ministry, sometimes some of the ministers, they may feel there is some jealousy when the Lord is anointing you. Everybody does not love you. And sometimes there are people that are waiting for you to fall. And this is how they felt about Jesus. They were waiting for Jesus to make a mistake. They were waiting so they can point the finger at him. But guess what? My God, my God, he's perfect. OK, so whatever they did, it would not harm Jesus's ministry. All right. So we're going to go uh, to verse 30. He that is not with me is he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathered not with me scattered abroad. Verse 31, it says, wherefore, I say unto you. All manner of sin and blaspheming shall be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheming against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh against the Son of Man, it shall not be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the, it shall be forgiven him, I'm sorry. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Okay, so the Pharisees, as we said, they were jealous of Jesus. How did the Pharisee explain 
away the miracle, okay? So the Pharisees flatly refused to consider the idea, but they did not deny that Jesus had exercised power over the demon. Rather than they say Jesus was divine, they concluded that Jesus had worked by the power of Belbuz, Belbuz, uh, or Satan, or the prince of the demons. How did Jesus use log logical reasoning to prove that the Pharisees were incorrect? The Pharisees' charge was not only wrong, but also totally illogical. Jesus pointed out that every cause must be unified or it falls apart. A kingdom that is divided by civil war will eventually come to run. A house torn by division cannot stand. So what I do love about Jesus, I love the way how he handled the conversations. Even though his character was being attacked, he did not attack theirs. He was not there breaking out his fist, ready to fight, nor is he putting it on social media, nor is he attack attacking the Pharisees personally. Of course, he could do it. He could tell them they were hypocrites, they were liars. He could have went that route, but he did not because God, he is a wise and a just God. He used wisdom in dealing with his enemies and they were his enemies. They were his enemies. And he said in verse 29 and 30, if he cast out the devil, then he is greater than the devil. The only way he could cast out the devil is to operate in a power that was greater than the devil. And it says, greater is he in us than he that's in the world. Okay, Jesus, he, they were casting out devil by the power of God. If, if they were casting out the devils by the power of God, the Pharisees could not logically charge that Jesus had been working with Satan. So why did Jesus insist that the kingdom of God had come to them? If he was indeed casting out demons by the spirit of God, the kingdom of God had come upon them. Jesus then should not be resisted, but accepted as coming from God. In rejecting Jesus, the Pharisees were opposing the rule of God. Also, why did Jesus say that the Pharisees Okay, but why was there no neutral ground when it comes to believe in Jesus? Either you believe him or you don't. How people respond to Jesus placed them in either on God's side or against his cause. We're either on the Lord's side or we're not on the Lord's side. And why did Jesus say that the Pharisees had committed an unforgivable sin? Because if you remember Jesus many times as he did miracles, he, he hid himself. He did. Because the people were, you know, there were so many people and sometimes he wanted to get away because of his hidingness. Those who spoke against Jesus often did so out of ignorance. That sin was forgivable. But to call a clear demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, a work of Satan, that was unforgivable. It was a rejection of the truth. Jesus knew that those Pharisees were not for him. They called him outside his name. They tried to destroy his reputation. And as I said, Jesus, they saw that his ministry was gaining influence. It was getting attention and they did not like it. When Jesus came to earth to become human, the visible manifestation of his deity was mass. And he often intentionally, as I said, he concealed his identity. And Jesus, he was not in those days recognized as the son of man by many people. Even in his close, even his close disciples had difficulty gasping that he was indeed God. And that is because of the, the if you look at all his stories and uh, the miracles that he, he did. And like I said, many a times, Jesus, he hid. Those who spoke against Jesus often, they did it out of ignorance. And again, that sin was forgivable, but to call a clear demonstration. Now, you know about God. You don't see what he did. You have been filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you turn around and say it was of the devil. This is an unforgivable rejection of the truth. Okay, now we're going to go to verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees asked, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. 
But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall not no sign be given to it, but the sign of Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart. There is nothing wrong with asking for a sign when your heart is in the right place. And many times we ask God to show me a sign, God. Uh, give me some type of uh, uh, sign that, that, that what, what I'm doing is right or uh, am I really called to preach? You know, maybe somebody said something and I felt the spirit. God, give me a sign. Is this you? There is nothing wrong with asking for a sign when your heart is right. And God, he gives us signs, some type of revelation to encourage our faith. If you remember the story in uh, Judges 6, Gideon, he asked God to show him a sign and God showed him a sign. However, the Pharisees, they were not genuine in asking for a sign. Again, they did not like Jesus. They did not want his ministry to progress and they were jealous of him. There were already signs, okay? Jesus was born a virgin, was a sign already. And the only sign that Jesus told him, okay, you all, have, you all know about the sign. You know about Jonas. You know about the three days in the, in the well's belly. You know all of this. I am not giving you not another sign. And I'm looking at the times we're living in. How many signs do we need to see that the coming of the Lord is near? What else do we have to tell our family members and tell our friends, God is coming. This is the end time. How many signs do God have to show us? So I'm looking about what's going on right now. How many signs got to show us? All right, next, Sister Wyatt. Okay, they ask for a sign. Rather than admit their error, and the Pharisees confronted, G confronted Jesus in a different way. They asked him, okay? So Jesus knew their heart. Jesus, he was so wise. You know, I'm not going that route again. You already know. You already know. You already know that a virgin was going to be born. You already knew about David. You, you, you all are scholars of the word. I mean, these were not dumb people. These people knew the word. They were... They were students of the word. Let's put it like that. Jesus said, I'm not going to show you all nothing else. The implication behind this request was that evidence Jesus had given so far was ambitious and unconvincing. This is what they're saying. Oh, you still haven't convinced me. In effort, they were saying that it was Jesus' fault that they did not believe. Now, you know that was not true. And so, you know, that was not true. What was the only sign that would be given? So Jesus let them know, hey, you know what? I'm going to show y'all a sign. But Jesus said, there would be only one more sign. And that would be sign of Jonah. And they knew about the sign of Jonah. They knew just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three day period. So Jesus will be in the heart of the earth for the same time. They knew all of this. And God, he knows our heart. We can go, oh, you know, we're not fooling God. He knows our heart. Yeah, I can go to God and say, blank, blank. God said, oh, come on, Sister Debbie. You know that ain't right. <laughs> God knows our heart. We're not fooling him. The Pharisees did not fool Jesus with their request. Jesus knew they were a bunch of hypocrites. They were not real. Their heart was not right. The outward appearance, yeah, they look good. They look like a, 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 a son of God. They look like it. But their heart, oh, they did the fasting. They did the praying. Oh, they did all of that, but their heart was not right. And Jesus was not going to give them another sign. Okay. And I wanted to go into this. What does blaspheming of the Holy Spirit mean? In general, the word blaspheming, of course, to this dictionary, it says the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. Blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is when you take the true work of the Holy Spirit and you speak evil of it, attributing his work to the devil. 
Many do not believe that this is some time a one-time thing, but it's, it's an ongoing rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit and over and over again, attributing his precious work to Satan himself. When Jesus addressed this topic, he was responding to what the Pharisees had actually done earlier in this chapter. And here's what happened. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that he can both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only Belzebub, the, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. The Pharisees, by their words, were denying the true work of the Holy Spirit. Even though Jesus was operating under the power of the Holy Spirit, the Pharisees were giving credit for his work to Belzebub, which is another name for Satan. By doing this, they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And that's something we never want to do. We know that God is real. We have seen his acts. We have seen the healing. We have seen the saving of our souls. And you know what is so beautiful about the demon, the man that was possessed with demon? Not only was he healed spiritually, but he was also healed naturally. There is natural benefits in, in getting God in our life. God not only saves us from sin, but he makes us whole. He heals our entire life naturally and spiritually. So it is a blessing, Sarah. There is a blessing of having Christ in our life. This demon-possessed man, he was so, I'm sorry. Uh, he, was, he was truly blessed. And we are truly blessed. As God saves us, he, it said there's riches unknown. Not only does he save our souls, he gives us peace. He protects us. All kind of benefits comes with being saved, with having Christ in our life. So this demon possessed man, oh, he was blessed because not only again was he healed spiritually, also naturally. The demons were there gone. They were gone. They were gone. And not only that, his mind got better. He, he was able to see. He was able to hear. He was able to do all of these things. And this is how our God works. He gives us all kinds of benefits. That one song said, that's what I like about Jesus. He, he does all kinds of things all wrapped up in one. It's all wrapped up in God. Everything is wrapped up in God. Everything we need is wrapped up in God. All right. Sister Wyatt. And I have a little um, little handout that you all may want to look at. And it says the story of Jonah foreshadows the redemption work of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but it is it is a lot to look at. Um, you know, at the end, um, it says Jesus preached um, that the city would be destroyed in 40 days. And, um, you know, so it's just something that you may want to look at in your own spare time. But there is. Uh, the story of Jonah foreshadows because people say, well, what does Jonah have to do with the redemption work of Jesus? So this chart will sort of uh, highlight and, and let you see at your spare time um, the foreshadows of the redemption work of Jesus Christ and um, Sister Wyatt. And as I was uh, praying about this lesson, um, I am so blessed that um, there was a video of our apostolic father, Bishop Paul A. Bowers. And he was preaching about, <laughs> about demons. And I thought, my God, this would be the highlight of my lesson. Um, he, how to overcome demons. Demons are alive and well, and some people don't believe it, but they are. But Bishop, our Bishop Paul A. Bowers preached how to overcome demons in 1989. Amen, Sister Wyatt. Amen, oh yeah. 
church. Huh? Now let the church say amen. A uh, blessed God, now pray for me just a little while today. Uh, and so the angels, God blessed them uh, and made them beautiful. Uh, and all they had to do was sing and, and give praise to God. Uh, but you see, Lucifer was made uh, the most beautiful of all. Uh, he was in a sense Miss Universe uh, and even perhaps Miss Heaven. Uh, he was more beautiful than anybody else. Uh, and he could sing better than any other angel. Uh, and so he got beside himself. Uh, he was impressed with his good looks and lovely voice. Uh, and so he said, well, there's nobody above me but God. Uh, and so I might as well raise myself uh, and take over God's place. Uh, but I'm here to tell you today, uh, amen, the Bible looked at the devil, Lucifer, uh, and saw him sailing through space uh, uh, so that when he went up to uh, to compete with God, uh, God hurled him out of there. Uh, God excommunicated him from heaven. And you see, the devil, Lucifer, uh, had contaminated some of the other angels. Uh, and when God kicked Lucifer out, uh, he put everybody else out that went along with him. I'm here to tell you, uh, uh, God will have nobody else before him. Uh, you see, I don't care how good you sing. And I don't care how beautiful you look. Uh, uh, God don't need nobody that don't love him. God doesn't need you today if you think you're bigger than God. God doesn't need you, but God wants somebody to fall down before him and say, Lord, I'm nothing without you. Lord, you made me what I am, and I'm going to magnify you. I'm going to glorify you and give your name praise today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so the, the Lord excommunicated Lucifer and he was he fell down and God kicked him out and he landed down here on earth and now he's made a wreck of this universe. He's undermined men. He's in every avenue of life in this world. He's in our political system. He's on our police force. He's walking about as a roaring lion. He has turned this world upside down and all of these fallen angels that God kicked out with him you see Satan drugged some with him when he came out he took some with him I want to tell you today don't hook up with anybody that's not on the Lord's side don't join in with no crowd that doesn't love the Lord because the blind lead the blind they'll all fall in the ditch but I I'll take Jesus for mine. I may have to cry, but give me Jesus. I may suffer a little, but give me Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. But give me Jesus. And so as you look on down through here, when you read the book of Jude chapter 1 and verse number 6, it lets us know that some of these demons that God kicked out of heaven that used to be angels, God has taken some of them and he locked them in chains. They're chained and waiting in hell for the judgment day. But then there's some loose around here that's getting at the saints of God. There's some that are roaming around uh, trying to steal your joy and trying to take your testimony. There's some that's roaming around here uh, trying to break up your home and cause you to lose your mind. There's some that today uh, that's seeking and going around. You see, it's the demon power. It's the power of the devil himself. It's demonic power that's driving people crazy. It's the power of the devil that's driving people to drink. It's the power of demons that's driving people to dope addiction. It's the power of the devil that's causing the homes to be broken up. It's the power of the devil that's separating husband from wife. And you see what the devil will do. He'll make the wife and the husband fight each other. But what you ought to know is that we're not 
enemies, but we ought to both gather together and gang up on the enemy that's got us fighting one another. It's the devil that's at work. It's the spirit of demons. You don't mind if I preach a little bit today. Hallelujah to God. Satan is loose. He's roaming. He's roaming the streets. Amen. What do you think? Has that woman standing on the corner? Amen. Making merchandise of her body. It's the spirit of the demon and the devil that's in her. What do you think makes that child? Amen. Fight back at his parents and being disobedient. It's the spirit of the demon that's in her. You see, when you come here, the devil is in you when you get here. He's in the little baby. He's in the child. That's why Jesus said, you've got to be born again because you came here wrong. You need a new birth. You need a new beginning. You need a new mother. You need a new father. And I'm glad that Jesus said you must be born again. And I can tell you enough, if you just join the church, the devil is not afraid of you. If you just join the church, the devil's not going to run from you. If you say the sinner's prayer, let me tell you now, while I'm passing, there is nobody nowhere can get saved by dialing an 800 number. There's nobody can get salvation. Hallelujah. By calling across the country, bowing down in front of your television and saying the sinner's prayer, I'm here to tell you the devil doesn't get excited when you, in fact, he's glad when you dial that number. He's glad when somebody deceives you because that's what he's, he's all about. He is a deceiver. But listen to what John said. Ye are of God, little children. Amen. Why do you say that, John? Because you have God down on the inside. That's what makes you God. Let the church say amen. Hallelujah. That's what makes us God's children. We have God on the inside. We went before God Almighty and we waited and we prayed until God came in. And when God comes in, the devil's got to move out. When God moves in, you see, before God moves in, he moves out the devil. Before you see, God is not a shacking up God. God. Ah. Glory. He's not a shacking up God. He doesn't shack up with the devil. He doesn't shack up with the demons. But God comes in and tells Lucifer, or tells that lying wonder, or get out of here. Move on out. When I say get out, I mean get out. Take your property. Get out. Take your dope. Take your nicotine. Take your lying. Get out. Get out! Get out! Hallelujah! Get out of here! You see, because I'm moving in, you get on out. And then not only that, when God puts the devil out, then God washes you. He cleans you. You see, he don't even want no sin hanging around. Anything that smells like Satan. Amen. And God washes you. He cleans you. He purifies you. He covers you with his blood. He wants to clean you up and clean you out. He gives you a good Holy Ghost physic, if you please. Hallelujah. And all of that evil, that sin, uh, God pushes it out. Uh, and then when God moves it out, uh, if the devil don't want to go, uh, then God drives him out. Uh, you see, uh, the more when you're seeking God uh, and when you're down before him, uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, I hear it said now. Uh, I hear folk criticize people uh, that said hallelujah, hallelujah, and got the Holy Ghost. Uh, but I'm here to tell tell you uh, uh, don't knock it too much uh, because it really works uh, yeah that's how i got it uh, saying hallelujah don't tell me uh, 
it doesn't work. Don't tell me there's nothing to it. But when I open my mouth, begin to praise God, the devil has to start getting his clothes together. When I start saying hallelujah, the devil packs up his belonging. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the glory. Thank you, Jesus. You see, the devil gets things together and he's got to move on out. And then God washes you. He saturates you. He cleanses you with his blood. And then he moves in and sets up headquarters. And now he's on the inside. You didn't join the church. You didn't kneel before a television. You didn't call an 800 number. But God himself, let me tell you one thing. There are more to be more folk in hell that dialed an 800 number but I'm here to tell you you better fall on your knees and call heaven ah. hallelujah you better fall on your knees and cry out to God Almighty or clap your hands and say hallelujah and so Jesus has now come in us we have God on the inside and he's greater than he that's on the outside hallelujah how do you know he's greater well we can see Jesus in the fourth chapter of Matthew when he went into the wilderness to pray and fasted 40 days and the devil came to him attempting him but Jesus was ready for him for you see Jesus said that I come in my father's name and that's how I'm coming in my father's name and who is my father Jesus Jesus I said Jesus <laughs> Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord again. Can you hear me? Yes. Praise, yes. The, praise the Lord again. I hope, you, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, yes. I, I, I thought what, what would be best to end this lesson is our bishop preaching out about, de about demons. So I hope you all be encouraged with this lesson. And thank you all again. Vantress Nesby. <laughs> <laughs> amen awesome <laughs> word awesome word i just want to say amen amen hallelujah hallelujah yes glory to god yes <laughs> jesus yes yes that was a powerful lesson and i want yeah. to clarify something uh here in the in case you didn't think that satan was real in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14, it tells us about Lucifer, the devil himself. Mm -hmm. How art thy fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And Satan, whose name was Lucifer, he was an angel in heaven, mm -hmm. just in case you didn't think this was real or not. Mm -hmm. But God is telling mm -hmm. us uh, and warning us what it is that we're up against in these last days. Yes, yes, yes. He's getting up, getting us prepared to do battle. And we have to be conscious. We have to be aware of the things around us. Mm -hmm. God is the one that will fight the battle. You just have to make sure that you are in the right frame of mind so that you can receive the help from God that you need. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against darkness, all sorts of spiritual wickedness in high places. This is where we at right now. So this lesson, uh, Sister Debbie, is very timely. 
And I want to thank you for doing such a great presentation. And thank God that we heard this back in the day, this message that Bishop Bowers preached, warning us that the enemy is, is, is under, under siege. He's trying to attack us on every hand. And we have to be aware that this is a spiritual battle that you're in. You can't, you can't fight this with guns and knives. It's a spiritual battle. Minister Nesbitt. Amen, amen. Uh, first, let me say, next week I'll be in Florida. You'll be getting me from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And amen. awesome word. Awesome, awesome. I mean, I tell you, I just couldn't hardly sit in my seat. <laughs> and I just love Bishop Biles with that message. The anointing was just coming out of the TV. It was just coming out of my computer. <clears throat> yeah. Just two things. When uh, uh, Sister Thomas mentioned about why, let me see, where did I write it? Well, I just got to go from a, what I can remember. Uh, one of the things about the Holy Spirit, um, they were denying the power. They were denying the power of God. And to mm -hmm. deny him is blaspheming against, you gave a beautiful um, uh, definition and it was correct. It was correct. There was nothing wrong with it. But I was thinking they were denying from your desperate from your definition. They were denying the power of the Lord. And another thing that we realize about these Pharisees, they were always depending on their forefathers that they were saved from Abraham. And they felt like they didn't have to live a righteous life or accept Jesus. But huh, we know the difference. And then there was one other thing about signs and wonders. <clears throat> We know that if signs and wonders would have been sufficient, Israel wouldn't have fallen in the wilderness because they had signs and wonders, but they didn't have Jesus. They didn't have the Holy Ghost and they failed. Only two of them came out because they didn't believe. They denied the power thereof. It's, off, it's a bad thing to deny the power of God. And, oh, you just did a beautiful, oh, I love it. I love it. A beautiful <laughs> job. And I said, stay tuned to next week for part Amen. two. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> brother, brother Leon, you had something to say? Oh, I was just saying, like, when the preacher was preaching, I was from Revelation. He's talking about when the devil was thrown down here with all his people. Yeah. yeah. You know, like they be always talking about UFOs. I just think UFOs is the fallen angels flying around here with them, you know. <laughs> and 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 man do everything. They be seeking all this stuff. They do everything but say God. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. they be looking all out and out of space. We know you looking for God, and you ain't fooling yeah. nobody. Yeah, you know, always looking where life came from. Like man, yeah, nobody we, falling. We man. know. <laughs> we know. And like the Bible said, signs and wonders, and yeah. they're definitely coming. Signs and yeah. wonders is definitely yeah. coming. Yeah, we we gotta be Bible, aware. You'll see it. Yeah, you don't we gotta be it. aware of the time that we living in. Amen. Uh, Minister Wagney. Uh, praise the Lord, everyone. It's a um, wonderful lesson, and like Sister Wyatt said, it's a timely message. Um, but one of the things that jumped out to me from the lesson is that um, this man was blind. He was dumb. He couldn't see. So he, in, in essence, he couldn't know who Jesus truly was. Yeah. Uh, the demons shut him up. They made him blind. They made him, he couldn't praise God because he couldn't speak. And God released him. Jesus released him that he can see the goodness of the Lord. Give him his voice back so he can praise and worship this God. Uh, in essence, the enemy will try to shut you up. He's going to try to make you blind to the goodness of Jesus. And these Pharisees, despite they could being able to see, being able to hear, they were just as dumb and blind as the dumb and blind man because they were able to see what Jesus was doing and they turned the other way. Yeah. Um, naturally in our lives, I'm, I, and I probably can speak for everybody here, we have been through something that we know that we know that we know that only God did it. Yeah. That only God did it. No one else could. Mm -hmm. And 
finally, the one of the things that came across my mind with the lesson that Bishop Bauer was preaching is that, you know, the Bible talk about in the last days, there's going to be a great falling away. And I think it was um, a lesson that allow us to be ready and to be prepared that we are not involved in the, the falling away in these last days. Because when the scriptures speak about the falling away, it's talking about the Christians, the ones who yeah. know God. Yeah. And, and like you said earlier, Sister Wyatt, we have to be prepared more than ever because the enemy is going to, just like the Pharisees try to shut up Jesus, the enemy is going to try to shut us up. So yeah. um, thank God for Sunday school, thank God for all the different lesson, wonderful lesson again, Sister Debbie Thomas and Amen. Uh, Bishop Bowers yeah. and some of those saints in the younger days in the background. It was really yeah. good to be. <laughs> hey, can I say one more thing? Yes, sir. People got to beware of AI. AI ain't no joke. Yeah. AI, AI going to fool the, a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have to be careful. Uh, you know, we have to really be in tune with the Holy Ghost. And because there is so much false doctrine. When you talked about Minister Wadeney of uh, falling away, you know, there's going to be a lot of people still in church but they fall away from the truth of the gospel. They fall away from the traditional uh, word of God and pick up all kind of stuff that's, that's not biblically sound or correct. And so I think a lot of us is, is going to fall away. And I ain't going to say us, but I just think a lot of people will fall away from, from the true foundation of the scripture. And, you know, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is what we have to be careful of because there's so much false doctrine that's going to trip up a lot of people. And we want to make sure that we stay within the confines of the scripture, that we follow the word. We got 66 books in the Bible. Over, over 300, 400,000 words. We don't need to be adding no more to that. <laughs> if we follow the pattern of what God say in his word, then how can you go wrong if you do with the way God tells us to do it? We have, and you said it too, uh, Brother Leon, when you talked about AI and all these artificial things that have come to try to uh, show you a greater, a greater secret. God told us that he ain't, we his friends. It ain't no secrets with him because we know him. We know who he is. We know what he stands for. We know what he said in his word. And if we don't be careful, we will go after every wind and doctrine instead of sticking to the basic principles of what God has already prepared for us in his word. And all of us have to be so careful that we stay in tune. If, if, if it's new, it ain't true. <laughs> you understand? Because this book been written long before we even got in here. So why is he trying to hide something from you now? Amen, somebody. Uh, yes, Sister Lord. Carol Wade, are you there? Yeah, let me say one more thing. That's why I don't read all these other interpretations. I'm like, I'm least smart enough to understand the Bible. You know how people write, right. this is what this means. Mm -hmm. I'm like, nah, it's mixing up too much. Let me stay in the right. Bible. And you I'll have be good. to be careful. Mm -hmm. The yeah. great falling away is falling away. I mean, I know there's other uh, interpretations to that. But uh, a great falling away is falling away from the truth of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Taking all this, uh, you know, taking a lot of philosophy and, you know, uh, great sayings that men ha have put out and substituting those things for what is the actual truth. You can fall away from the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. And this is what we have to be careful of is that we stick to the script. Mm -hmm. Whatever God said in his word, let God be true. And every man, a liar, mm -hmm. you see, <laughs> the only truth that means anything is what he's saying in this word. And I'm going to get to you, Minister Nesbitt. Let me hear Sister Carol wait, and then we come back to you. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, awesome lesson, uh, Sister Debbie. And um, 
I agree with everybody that the cherry on the top was uh, to hear Bishop Bowers preaching in his heyday. Um, I, um, I, it made me think about, you know, Satan was in heaven and he still wasn't satisfied. And uh, he wanted more and more and more. He was uh, disillusioned. And uh, I think that's a, a caveat to the saints that we have to be careful not to want more or something different than what God is sharing with us. And you were talking about the different translations and not translations per se, but the different philosophies that are out there and something new and something different. I think that uh, we have to be obedient to what God has said and not what other things that we may hear that may be t- uh, tickling our ears. I think that's what the scripture says. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the question that always comes up to me when I read this lesson is what else do we need to see before we are able to believe God in his fullness? And yeah. that's even, like I said, a lesson to the saints because we tend to believe God just enough to get us to our next trial. And yeah. As soon as our trial comes, then we're all tripping out and not sure of what's going on or not sure of God's character. And God is saying, what more do you need to see to know that I am a loving God, to know that I am a more than capable God and that I am able to do what is needed, you know, according to my will. And um, so I just I just love that because everybody's always asking for a sign, even uh, us who are in the church. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think that, you know, those 66 books that we have in the Bible, that's enough. You, you know, and then when you look at the scriptures and I, I, uh, uh, one time Bishop Bowers, he was on the book of Psalms for like a month, the same scripture, the same passage of scripture every every time he preached. And I'm telling you, I used to be the one recording this stuff. So I'm like, wait a minute, didn't he just preach out of that last week? And then each time he preached out of that same passage of scripture, he got a different message, but it was all in the same context of that scripture. And so to pick up a whole lot of other stuff, when you can get so much out of God and how many, how long you've been saved, how long you've been in the church and you have not exhausted the 66 books yet. There is enough in that Bible that will take you from here to eternity and to add anything or to take anything away from it. It's, it's, it's to your own detriment because God has told us that his word will not fade away. You know, God's word will never fade away. Uh, Minister Nesbitt. Yes, I wanted to say something about uh, the word. You know, God had gave them 10, <clears throat> 10 commandments and they added to that. They came up with 631 laws and commandments. They kept adding unto it until they got completely away from the Lord. And when this situation happened with the deaf and dumb man, uh, see, when Jesus came in and performed and did the work of faith, it showed them up. It made them realize, oh, we ain't been doing what we were supposed to be doing. Because Mm -hmm. Moses had given them laws for healing and deliverance. But see, they had got away from that adding to the word, <clears throat> doing what they want to the word. That's what I wanted to say. We really yeah. do have to stick with the strip, stick with what we Amen. have. Those 66 books is sufficient. Amen. Amen. Because mm-hmm. you start adding all this other stuff to it, you know, you get confused, you know, and this is how, this is how Satan works. Yeah. You know, and he, 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 he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy those three areas. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. That's how he 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 operates, and he's so perfect in that because he's been doing it same game plan, yes. Yes. the same game plan, mm-hmm. and they work. 
but we got to allow God's spirit on the inside of us. That's why he tell us you must be born of the water and the spirit. Mm. Or you cannot enter in. Neither can you even see the kingdom unless you are born again. And this is where we are in the in the big picture. It's like, Lord, let your Holy Spirit take over so that I can see my way through what you're seeing. You can't, you can't keep looking at life the same way. Mm. Not in this time. Mm. Because we don't know what the future holds for us. As far as this life is concerned, but we know who holds our future. And God is the one that we need to make our peace calling and election sure. We need to pay attention and listen to this too. The people that, uh, I think Bishop Bowers talked about it in his message, that how the demons were, were they're here. The devil has been here. He kicked him out of heaven and took a third of the angels with him. So a lot of times we when we're dealing with people, you could you know when they when they ain't right. <laughs> mean, evil, contrary, doing things to try to distract you from doing what God would tell you to do. You got to pay attention to the people around you and the things that's going on in this life and, and, and ask God to guide me. Let me see what you see. Take care of me, Lord, because in you I live and move and have my being. We are living to live again. God is coming soon and we want to be ready when he comes. Eternal God, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the lesson that you have allowed us to hear. We pray that you will let your word take root in, us, in our hearts that we will not sin against you. We pray that you would help us to be counted worthy to go back with you when you come. We pray that you will help us to live the life of holiness and sanctification and that your spirit will rise up in us, Lord God, so that we could be aware of the things that we are doing, hearing, and saying. Speak to our hearts today, Lord God, and let your word guide us be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway, and help us to be about your business. Thank you for every soul that is represented here today, every family, Lord God, who has come to want to hear your word and those who need your help and need financial blessings and miracles in their life and healings in their bodies. Have your way, Lord, and thank you for all that have come here to hear your word. And thank you for all of those who participate in this service. And as they go throughout the holidays, Lord God, Lord Jesus, bless them and strengthen them. Don't let nobody, Lord God, be left to themselves, Lord, but let them have peace in the midst of the holidays. Protect them from danger seen and unseen as they travel. And Lord God, bless their families in a mighty way. Is only you can do. And we love you and we appreciate you and we are humbled by your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You all are love with an amen. everlasting love. Amen. God amen. bless you all so much. You all have a great week. If I don't see you next week, I do understand, but we're going to be here next Sunday. Lord's willing, we'll see you in Sunday school. Happy God Thanksgiving. bless you. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Amen. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving Thank to everybody. Yeah. God bless you all.